Agitation and desperation, gamers from all around the world. It is me, Lucian, the Phantom Gamer, and tonight we will dwell where souls are damned forever, enchanted by a symphony that will steal our souls to allow the night to claim us all. It is once again time for us to use our crosses and whips, for tonight it is kill or be killed as Dracula's castle beckons for us, and no man can say who shall emerge victorious. Castlevania Symphony of the Night. Yeah, you know it's good. Actually, way better than simply good. It's legendary. And you don't need me to tell you that. No, what I think might be more useful is some orientation on which version is more suitable for you who are watching this video right now. Yeah, I know, Symphony of the Night isn't famous for its billions of revisions like a certain Street Fighter, however, there have been many ports since its original release in 1997 on PlayStation, courtesy of the good old Konami. In fact, there have been a slight alteration of content jumping from one version to the other. So elation and jubilation, gamers from all around the world! I am Lucian and this is the World Gamer Show. And today, we're going to explore the various versions of Castlevania Symphony of the Night, so that you can decide which one is best for you. And that's not all, since this is a huge topic, I need some serious reinforcement. Don't worry, young master, I'll take you to the review den. Don't play that song, not that song! I hate it when they play that song. Well, hello, my friends, I'm the Review Den, and today I'm teaming up with Lucian, the World Gamer. We're going to be looking at some great ports of Castlevania Symphony of the Night, and specifically, I'm going to be looking at the Xbox Live Arcade version. But I've also got some cool tidbits, some extras, and some lost media, including a secret ending to the game which never made it to production, but the voice lines were recorded, and I've got them. So be sure to stay tuned for that. Whoa, buddy, that's great. Thanks so much for passing by and of course make yourself at home. Same as our viewers, you want to stick around until the end for sure, cause there are some serious surprises along the way. So sit back, relax and let's dive right in. Castlevania Symphony of the Night was developed by Konami and originally released on the first PlayStation in March 1997, even though the origins of this title can be traced far earlier. But for this, I will pass the mic to the handsome Review Dan. Hear that? You are handsome! And that's right, see Rondo of Blood, the prequel to Symphony, actually had a sequel in development for the Sega 32X called Castlevania The Bloodletting. Information is very scarce on this title, but it did show three character sprites including Richter, Maria, and an unnamed rival character, confirming there was some connection to the game we got. It even showed up in Konami's 1995 Consumer Electronics Show brochure after development switched to the PS1 and Saturn. Eventually though, the project was scrapped and most of the development team was shifted to the game we all know and love. Now, as a side note, there is a fan-made game out there, Castlevania The Bloodletting, but this is not connected to the official prequel. So far, the only thing that comes from that game are the character sprites, although I am curious if that idea of a rival character was later used in Castlevania Circle of the Moon for the Game Boy Advance. Thanks, buddy. We will find our friend later on. 
Now it is back to the actual symphony we know and love. It was first released on PlayStation, so this is the base version. One big disclaimer before we begin, this is not a full review of Castlevania Symphony of the Night, so if that's what you're looking for, there are plenty of YouTubers that already did a fantastic job at it. I will give you a bit of context, of course, but if you really want a review from me, well, Symphony of the Night is a timeless must-play masterpiece. There, that's my review for you. The aim of this video is to answer one simple question. Which version is better for you? Whether you are a newcomer to the series or you already finished a specific version but are hungry for more. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to analyze each port of the game and see its pros and cons for ourselves. So yeah, if you're still here, let's move on. In Symphony of the Night, you get to explore the castle of Count Dracula in the shoes of his son, Alucard. Symphony threw away the linear style of the previous games and mixed a freely explorable castle with RPG mechanics, like experience points, leveling up and a proper inventory system. Everything about Symphony is now iconic. From its gorgeous 2D graphics and incredibly smooth animations to its intricate level design, passing through its cheesy voice acting. Die, monster! You don't belong in this world! The main castle consists of 13 interconnected areas. Once you beat the boss Richter Belmont, meeting specific requirements, you unlock the inverted castle, which consists in 13 more areas which are flipped upside down for double the gameplay. Once you finish the game properly by beating Dracula, you unlock Richter Belmont himself as a playable character. Granted you could play as him in the prologue of the game, this time you will be able to fully explore the castle with him. He keeps all the moves from the prologue, which means he can explore certain areas way earlier than Alucard, and basically skip a lot of rooms, making it a joy for speedrunners. Also this is perfect for those who wanted to enjoy a more classic experience since Richter doesn't gain levels nor does he become more powerful as the game progresses, with the exception of his HP increasing after finding each life vessel. Richter also doesn't have access to any inventory, with most of in-game items being replaced by simple small hearts in the map, which allows him as usual to use sub-weapons and their powerful item crash. In fact, the item crash of the holy water, called Hydrostorm, is so powerful that can reduce most bosses to ashes in just few seconds. His special moves, done with buttons combinations just like Street Fighter, also allows him to reach certain areas far earlier than Alucard. So much so that Richter can actually skip a huge portion of the castle and go straight to the final boss if the player can figure out the quickest route. This less linear style also goes for Maria, but we will get to her soon enough, as sadly she is not playable on PlayStation. Anyway, this pretty much covers the content of the original PlayStation version. Overall, there is no reason why you shouldn't play this version, aside from its accessibility. It was released on the first PlayStation, but also as a PS1 classic on the PlayStation Store, which would allow you to buy and download and play it on PlayStation 3, PlayStation Vita, and even the PlayStation Portable, which allowed players to experience the game on the go for the first time. These are all considered retro consoles now, so if you have access to them, this original version is certainly not a bad one to go for. However, in June 1998, another version of the game was released for the Sega Saturn in Japan only. The Saturn version of Akumajo Dracula X, Nocturne in the Moonlight, as it's called in Japan, did many things differently from the previous PlayStation iteration. Since the internal hardware structure of the Sega Saturn is very different from that of the PlayStation, some technical compromises had to be made by the developers to make sure it released not too far off from the original release of the PlayStation version. Sadly, this meant that the loadings took longer and dithering will take the place of most transparency effects. On top of that, rather than using the Saturn's increased resolution, the game was simply stretched to fit the screen and it also slows down much more frequently than its PS1 counterpart, especially when 3D effects come into place. 
It's clear that the developers had trouble optimizing the code that they have developed uh, specifically for the PS1 and bring it to the Saturn. It must have been a painful process even just bringing the game to the state that it was released, but it's still undeniably a technical mess. However, one thing that I simply can't understand is why do we need to go through the pause menu to access the map? That's right, while in the PlayStation version you would simply press the select button to bring up the map, in the Saturn version you first need to pass through the pause menu, which itself takes several seconds more than the PS1 version, and then press the C button. And to go back to the game, again you need to retrace your steps by first going back to the pause menu and finally back to the game. This is simply an atrocious design choice, which I feel has nothing to do with the supposed technical limitations. However, developers must have felt pretty sorry for all this, because to compensate for the technical mess and for the extra time that the Saturn owners had to wait to play the game, they've been kind enough to include a ton of extra features. Let's go in order. First, we have a useful sound test, which allows us to play all the music in the game, and this is a soundtrack you don't want to miss. Of course, nowadays we can hear these classics on YouTube or other streaming platforms, but back in the day, when internet wasn't as accessible as today, the sound test made way more sense. On top of that, you can even listen to new renditions of classic tracks which are tied to the extra content in the game, which we will get to soon. Once we actually start the game, we notice something amazing. We can now choose straight away and without the necessity to unlock them, two extra characters aside from Alucard. We can play as Richter straight away, while in the PS1 version we needed to unlock him by first beating the game properly, and for the first time ever in Symphony of the Night we can now play as Maria, who was actually rumored to be also in the PS1 version back in the day. The truth was simply that she was playable in the Saturn version, and also plays radically different from both Alucard and Richter. Well, the gameplay loop is certainly more similar to Richter's playthrough, but her moves and gameplay style are radically different, and she is certainly the star of the show. First, she is proficient in magic, and can indeed shoot magical projectiles, which actually makes her style more similar to Mega Man. She just shoots magic beams instead of lemons. Pew pew! I mean, for Christ's sake, she can even charge her shot. Actually, she needs to stand still while shooting, but she can also triple jump, which means that right from the start she can get access to most of the areas way earlier than Alucard, again, just like Richter, and she can even heal herself, which is a big, big help. Her special move inputs are also the same as Richter, but producing different moves in most cases. Speaking of Richter, he also has something new. In particular, he can show off his new outfit, which actually matches his official artwork much closer, rather than his recycled the sprite from Rondo of Blood. However, while this is his default outfit when facing him in Alucard's story, the new outfit actually needs to be unlocked via cheat code. Otherwise, he will use his classic outfit from Rondo of Blood. But it's a very simple cheat. When beginning a new game, we simply need to highlight Rector and keep pressing up while confirming with the C button. So already there is enough new content to satisfy most fans, but there's actually more. Two new areas are introduced, or rather reintroduced, for each of the two castles, the underground garden and the cursed prison, and their inverted equivalents, the hell garden and the soul prison. But why did I say reintroduced? Well, because at least the underground garden was planned to be present also in the original PS1 version, but was taken out at the last minute. Proof of this is the fact that a portion of the room leading to the underground garden can still be accessed using a glitch in the PS1 version, right at the beginning. 
Anyway, while most of the fans find these areas pretty weak from a level design point of view, and I can somewhat agree, I still love their overall atmosphere. On top of that, this is also where we can find most of the new cast of enemies, which perfectly fit the level they're in. Here is also where we can listen to the new remix tracks that I mentioned earlier when I spoke of the sound test. These are very good renditions of classic Castlevania themes, which are definitely worth checking out, even if you don't plan to try this version. Well, these are the most important part of the extra content. There are still few more things, like some extra familiars and items, including one that allows Alucard to run just like Richter, so that finally speedrunners can stop wiping the floor. And that about covers the Saturn version. Overall, this doesn't provide quite the same smooth experience as the PS1 does, the performance issues that afflict the game makes it the inferior version to play, However, content-wise, it's quite the opposite. There is so much more content here compared to the original that fans of Symphony of the Night that have explored the castle in and out might want to check this out. Most of this extra content was never added to subsequent re-releases of the game, effectively locking it for what seems it will be like forever on the Sega Saturn. So yes, this version here is for the hardcore fans. If you've never played Symphony of the Night before, this one is not the one you should go for. Unless, big unless here, you choose to play the extended V1.5, the fan hack that fixes most of the issues here, including some performance hiccups, some visual effects like better transparencies, and even some gameplay issues, like being finally able to summon the map with the press of a single button. Ah, oh, finally. This is truly awesome. Once again, the fans came to save the day, just like with Mega Man X6, with the Twix mod. Thanks, Mother, for making bad games great again! Did you know? Castlevania Symphony of the Night is now regarded as a timeless classic, but upon its first release in 1997, not everyone was enthusiastic about its presentation. IGN complained about the graphics, stating that they were too similar to the likes of the SNES and Genesis. Now, I'm no game developer, but I'm pretty sure the SNES, as wonderful as a machine it was, wouldn't have been capable of running Symphony of the Night. So yeah, that's simply IGN being IGN. With reviews like these and an admittedly small marketing budget, it was no wonder that Symphony sold below expectations initially. But thanks to the word of mouth spreading about its undeniable quality, it managed to sell over a million units worldwide, and even got its own infamous PS1 green label greatest hits version in America. The pure definition of a sleeper hit. The year is 2007. With the explosion of the World Wide Web, gaming consoles finally began to provide games through the Internet. And Microsoft, with its Xbox brand, definitely pioneered this concept of download gaming. But for this part, I'd rather have the trusty review than take the lead again. Now you might think this is just another port of Symphony of the Night, but believe it or not, this game actually played a role in the evolution of the digital storefronts as we know them today. So let me set the table a bit on how this particular version landed on Microsoft's platforms of all places. The XBLA storefront launched Okay, well, it launched as we know it, fully integrated alongside the 360 in 2005. Yes, even the original Blades dashboard featured it. The idea was to give players fun bite-sized games in between full disc releases, and to keep things orderly, a few restrictions were included. They had to have achievements, they had to have a free demo, and they had to be under 50 megabytes. Well, that's not bad. Modern Warfare is 200 gigabytes, so I guess 50 isn't that... Oh no, not 50 gigabytes, 50 megabytes. 
There are calculator apps bigger than that. The reason, like Xbox Live itself, was to get gamers to play together. Not all 360s had a hard drive initially, you could just buy a memory card for your profile and saves. And since the smallest memory card was 64 megabytes, the idea was that players could download an XBLA game, pop their memory card into a friend's 360, and enjoy it there. This worked fine for smaller games like Geometry Wars, Uno, Turtles, and Hexic, but when 2007 rolled around and they announced one of the greatest games of all time was coming to the platform, it presented a problem. Symphony of the Night has one of the most stunning soundtracks of all time, and it was presented in awesome CD quality, which generously filled the PS1's blackback CDs. So, to accommodate this game, Microsoft made the decision to raise the download cap to 150 megabytes, enough to fit the game and the soundtrack, albeit strongly compressed. Later games like Marvel vs. Capcom, Shadow Complex, and Watchmen helped slowly remove restrictions, but Symphony was the game to truly start the drive towards the entire game downloads we have today, for better or worse. So, what did we get for all that lead-up? Well, a surprisingly decent port as it turns out. SOTN for XBLA Stop it. Sorry, is based on the original PS1 version, unlike the Saturn and Dracula X ports, so the gameplay is in its original pure form. You don't get to fight as, or against, Maria, as the Dracula X ports added back in, but Richter is still there, as is the Axelord armor. There's no Nose Demon or Sprite Fairy, and finally, there's no extra Saturn areas, although those are exclusive to the Saturn. None of the PlayStation versions, even the later ports, get those. The Sword Brothers glitch still works for duplicating gems, although not for exiting the chapel. You can exit the map with a Double Hearts refresh glitch. Finally, Richter's downslide is still super powerful, and yes, you can swim in doggo form. Gameplay-wise, yeah, it's all here. Everything plays as awesome as you remember it. No, the real discussion for the XBLA port is presentation. Being a two-generation-old game means you're presenting a 240p image on a system that renders an upscaled 1080p, so by default it includes an image smoothing or enhanced mode. And surprisingly, it's pretty good. Many retro compilations, even to this day, tend to be over-aggressive with pixel smoothing, but Symphony of the Night manages to round off the edges without looking blurry. Even the PS3's smoothing mode goes a little soft here by comparison. The only downside is you can see some artifacting with objects like the Bounding Stone, and there's some slowdown at the bottom of the waterfall in the caverns, but this goes away with the normal mode. And yes, normal mode lets you see the game with all those nice sharp pixels. You can even resize and adjust the display to your liking without the awkward pixel stretching of the Saturn version. My only complaint is you can't disable the wallpaper in this version. I mean, I like that it has the cool animated clouds floating by, but 4x3 games should at least have the option for plain black borders, and instead you get Alucard and Dracula engaged in this never-ending staring contest. Made you blink. Uh, uh I didn't, Dad. Okay, the elephant in the room. The big compromise here is the audio. Shrinking hundreds of megabytes of CD quality audio into a 95 megabyte package required some high powered compression, and they didn't quite have the lossless algorithms that we have nowadays. The good news is there aren't any audio artifacts or static or that metallic tinniness of old Napster era compression. You can tell they work to get the best sound possible, but you do lose some clarity off the top end. It's the sort of thing you might not notice on TV speakers, but on a good sound system, you can tell the difference. Sound effects are a bit more flat as well. You don't quite get the cool stereo separation, such as when you hear Alucard swing his sword in the original. However, and yes, I will die on this hill, having the original voice track with PS1 Chris Redfield, Scott McCulloch as Richter, and an honestly better script, Fight Me, is worth keeping the original for, even if you enjoy the added content of the PSP ports. Count Dracula rises but once every century, and my roll is over. If I can resurrect him, then the battle will last for eternity! Impressive. You're very strong. What is it you want? You didn't come here to tell me that. And finally, FMV was removed from the US version, so you don't get the Konami logo or those glorious first-gen PS1 movies of the castle appearing, but that was pretty much a given to keep the file size down. 
Overall, I'd say this is a surprisingly good port of one of the best side-scrollers of all time, and since it's backwards compatible with Xbox One and the series consoles, both Sony and Microsoft fans have a chance to play this legendary title. Indeed, and for our friends collectors who love to have their games in physical format, you're in luck, because this version was also released as part of a collection on the Xbox 360, called Konami Classics Volume 1 along with Frogger and Super Contra. The only thing I wish it had more is the extra content of the Saturn version. But overall, this Xbox 360 version brought back Symphony of the Night after 10 years, and a new release of Symphony of the Night is always a good thing in my book. Next, we have arguably one of the better releases in the Castlevania history. I'm speaking of Castlevania The Dracula X Chronicles. Released in the same year as the Xbox Live Arcade version, this PlayStation Portable exclusive was first made available in October 2007. While it may be labeled as the second chapter in the Chronicles series, second to Castlevania Chronicles, the re-release of the classic Castlevania for Computer Sharp 68000 on PlayStation, these two games have hardly anything in common. It might have been just a coincidence that the names are so similar. The Dracula X Chronicles is effectively a compilation of games, even though two-thirds of it must be unlocked, but we will get to it soon. The main portion of the game is the remake of Castlevania Rondo of Blood, originally released on PC Engine in 1993, exclusively in Japan, and that stayed so for more than 10 years. Rondo of Blood was, and still is, regarded as one of the better classic Vania games, and with its alternate routes and multiple playable characters, it's also considered the somewhat perfect junction to link the classic Castlevania style with the newer Metroidvania gameplay that would later follow. This remix certainly makes justice to the original material, with its gorgeous 2.5D graphics and its gameplay as tight as the original. Speaking of which, the original 1993 title was also included as an unlockable, and moreover, the whole Castlevania Symphony of the Night was also hidden within the game, in a sort of gameception. When a full game is hidden within another full game, effectively doubling or even tripling the experience like in this case. I've already talked about Gameceptions in a previous video of mine, which is passing right now on your screen, but I've also put a link in the description for your convenience. I've also talked specifically about the Dracula X Chronicles in that video, so you might really want to check it out. Anyway, that's why I mentioned earlier that this can totally be considered a collection, because this is effectively three games in one. Moreover, this version of Symphony of the Night also has its share of differences. After hearing fans' complaints about all the extras from the Japanese and Saturn versions that were absent from the original PS1 release, the developers decided to try and restore as many of them as possible. For example, two previously Japan-exclusive familiars, the Fairy and the Nose Demon, were restored. On top of that, finally Maria made her way back to the PlayStation. But this isn't the same Maria as we saw in the Saturn. This one played much more like the original Maria from Rondo of Blood, which makes sense for the sake of consistency. Instead of the Mega Man-like projectiles, she uses her animal friends, just like in Rondo. Moreover, she's also got a dash very similar to that of Just Belmont from Harmony of Dissonance, in which you can press the left and right shoulder buttons to move to the correspondent direction. But the twist is that she can also perform it continuously in the air. Also, the boss battle against her before getting the Holy Glasses when playing as Alucard is also restored, and was originally present only in the Saturn version. However, this time you still need to beat the game once before accessing her, just like with Richter and the original PS1 game. But well, at least we finally got her back on Symphony of the Night, and while still maintaining a good technical performance overall, which is something that the Saturn version simply couldn't do. But something actually got lost in the transition. The original voice acting, so cheesy you could taste the cheese, was replaced by a whole new cast of actors. Dracula, die now and leave this world. You'll never belong here. Oh, but this world invited me. While the new voiceover is not bad by any means, and it still tries to be as theatrical as possible, it is not quite as iconic as the original, which will always be my favorite. On the flip side, 
Since this is a portable version, a new suspend and quick save feature was added to Symphony of the Night, along with the rest of the titles in the collection, which allow us to quickly save and resume wherever we left off previously. Very convenient. So, who is this version for? Well, sadly the whole collection stayed kind of exclusive to the PSP. You will soon understand what I mean by kind of exclusive. Anyway, if you have a PSP, this is an essential part of its library and should not be missed. And you get three games in one, what more can you ask for? This video will resume straight after a short commercial break. Fear has no form. Fear has no name. But now, fear has an address. Castlevania Symphony of the Night for your PlayStation from Konami. I don't know about you, but I love these old video games commercials, and I'm glad they're being preserved. But some things are more difficult to preserve, especially when it comes to cut content in video games. And surely, even a game as cool as Symphony of the Night must have made a few cuts here and there. Some hidden relics floating around the corners of the internet, just waiting to be found, and some might even resurface if you dig enough. But for this, on to the review then. Here we go again! Now when Symphony released, it garnered critical acclaim for its gameplay, presentation, and content. But as with any product at the mercy of a corporate schedule, some cuts had to be made. Some of these were voice clips that Konami actually added back into the game, starting with the Dracula X Chronicles on the PSP, such as if you head back to the regular castle not too long after reaching the inverted castle. Shaft. The Dark Priest is in the other castle. He's trying to resurrect Dracula. You must hurry. You two get out of here. I'll finish this. Be careful, Alucard. I'll pray for your soul. The good priest welcoming you to the chapel. Rest here in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Meeting Shaft at the finale. So you are the one called Shaft? I am he and the fairy's lullaby if Alucard pops down in a chair to rest for a bit. Actually, this one is in the original Japanese release, but it was cut for the US. Some of these remain unused, including a number of game over voice clips if you die against specific bosses. Ha! I knew it! Only the Count is a true match for me. Now you'll be my own personal slave. I thought you might be the one. But I guess I was wrong. But my personal favorites are easily Scott McCulloch, aka the original Chris Redfield, as Richter chewing the scenery during the battle against Alucard. Impressive! You were able to avoid my whip. Let's see how you like this! Impressive! But you can't escape this! Awesome! You are mighty indeed! The blood of Dracula flows strongly in you after all! Oh! More! Fight more! My blood is not yet quenched! <laughs> the coolest of all cut content, however, was an entire ending. A truly bad end, where Maria would fall to the darkness, and both she and Richter would have to be defeated, leaving Alucard all alone after having to destroy his only friends. Yikes! This was confirmed by Koji Igarashi, where if you wore the holy glasses during the fight with Richter, but still defeated him by mistake, Maria would show up to help him and Shaft would possess her instead, leading to a total downer of an ending. Victor! You're too hurt! Ma maria Don't hurt Victor anymore! If not for you, I would have lost to this fool. <sighs> For demons, I hold you to your oath. Defend your master who commands you. Ah, oh, such power in such a little girl. <laughs> it won't end like this. You should be destroyed along with this castle. <laughs> 
It's over, but the sacrifice was great. Maria, Richter, I did not wish for you to die. Such is the fate of mortals. I'm certain that some dark force was behind Maria's transformation, but it doesn't matter now. Now these were all bits of cut content from Symphony, but there is actually an entire spin-off game that can now be considered lost media. There was an iOS and Windows phone puzzle game called Castlevania Puzzle Encore of the Night, which was a basic retelling of the game, but replaced the gameplay with, well, puzzle battles, just like Puzzle Fighter. Unlike Puzzle Fighter, though, this was pretty much a flop and had its price cut almost immediately. As of late 2016, this was delisted, so until someone can truly emulate iOS or a Windows phone, this remains lost to the sands of time. Finally, we have the PlayStation 4 collection, Castlevania Requiem, which includes Rondo of Blood and Symphony of the Night, released in October 2018. Now, this is a somewhat controversial release, if you ask me, because you see, this is nothing but a butchered version of the previous Dracula X Chronicles, but without the remake of Rondo of Blood. Heck, even the menus and the options are mostly the same. You want more proof than that? The voice acting is also the same as in Dracula X Chronicles. This is such a cheap cash grab. I know that I said previously that anytime Symphony of the Night gets re-released is always a good thing, but Symphony of the Night is not the point here. The point is that this was clearly supposed to be a remastered of the whole collection, including the remake of Rondo of Blood, but they simply couldn't be bothered to upscale it to HD apparently. Well, whatever, let's get on with the video because we're almost there. Well, there is not really too much to add. As I just said, these are the exact same games as the PSP collection, just upscaled to 1080p and with 4K support. Again, it's still a good thing that the game is available to newer generation of gamers. I just criticized Konami's attitude in this case. They really went for the bare minimum here. Still, that doesn't change the fact that this is a very accessible version of the game, which is also backwards compatible with the PlayStation 5. <laughs> So yeah, these are all the versions. In the end, when all is said and done, which version should you play? Which one works the best for you? Well, if you are into retro gaming and also played Symphony of the Night before, you should try and aim for the Saturn version, which is the version that you most likely didn't play due to its not easy accessibility. Its bunch of extras makes it perfect for those who already got the full Symphony of the Night experience but still want more and feel curious about playing a very unique version, if certainly not the best from a technical perspective. If you love to play on your Xbox, the original Xbox Live Arcade game is still available and backwards compatible with newer consoles, albeit based on the most basic version of Symphony of the Night, the PS1 original. If you are a PlayStation player, you should go for the collection Castlevania Requiem on PS4, which is also playable on PlayStation 5, and it includes the extras of the PSP version, like a playable Maria and the original Rondo of Blood. Speaking of which, my personal favorite way to play it is exactly on the PSP, because it also includes both the original and the remake of Rondo of Blood. On top of that, I can play it on the go, which is a very convenient way, thanks to the useful quick save feature. PS3, PSP and PS Vita also received an emulated version of the PS1 original through the PlayStation Store, albeit without the convenience of the quick save function. But these versions are digital only, and with the PS Store for those platforms hanging by a thread, you might want to snatch them before it goes offline for good. But what about our friend collectors? Well, with all the rare stuff to hunt down, they have their job cut out for them. The original PS1 version is like the Holy Grail, especially in its European Special Edition, which also includes a beautiful artwork and an awesome soundtrack bonus disc. This specific version is not only rare, but also quite expensive. The Sega Saturn version, only available in Japan, is also not a cheap buy, but at least it's not that rare. 
If you want a physical version of Symphony of the Night on the Xbox 360, you will have to hunt down a copy of the Konami Classics Volume 1, which, while not as expensive as the others, it is also not that cheap. But at least it's there, it's physical. Limited Runs also took the care of bringing a physical version of Castlevania Requiem on PS4, thankfully. But that got me thinking. With all these Castlevania collections available, wouldn't it be awesome if they released a Castlevania Ultimate Collection, including Requiem, Anniversary Collection and also the Advanced Collection? I doubt that they don't fit in a Blu-ray altogether. Well, as I always say, one can dream. Overall, there is not really a bad way of playing Castlevania Symphony of the Night. It is such a masterpiece that even the bad Saturn performance can't really manage to ruin. And even that version has something going for it content-wise. And truth be told, most versions run very smoothly anyway. It's a pleasure to see that Symphony of the Night is so accessible today. And if you still somehow managed not to try it out, you are doing yourself a big disservice and I strongly advise that you go out and play it in any way you can because as I just said, the only bad way to play Symphony of the Night is to not play it. Well, except for the Tiger Electronics handled version, just stay away from that one. Well, that is all from us for today, folks. I'm very happy that the review then joined me for this video. It has been an absolute pleasure. He does some serious quality content, including some awesome retro reviews, so you'd better do yourself a favor and go check his channel out. You can find the link in the description. And thank you so much, Lucian, for letting me team up with you. It's hard to find a better game to collaborate on than Symphony of the Night, so I appreciate it. And to you and everyone out there, be sure to keep going, because you are worth it. And we're also interested in your thoughts about Symphony of the Night. Did you ever play it? If so, on which console? Which version you think it's the best? Share your thoughts or memories in the comment section down below. If you're a Castlevania fan, and if you made it this far into the video, I have every reason to believe so, I've also other Castlevania related videos on my channel. So you might also be interested in seeing the video I did covering the elusive beta of Castlevania Resurrection on Dreamcast. And also if you enjoyed this content, Eh, maybe leave a like, subscribe and share it around, but no pressure at all. I just want to thank you very much for taking some of your precious time to watch this video to the end. I will be sure to see you in my next one, but until then, stay safe, play safe, world gamers. Oh, and happy Halloween! Ha 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 ha!